I'd like to thank everyone who uh, participated by sending in uh, photos. Uh, I received more than 25 photos from uh, about 20 different people and uh, collected together, curated, uh, I think, an interesting uh, uh, parlor game. For those of you who aren't familiar uh, with either 20 questions or I spy with my little eye, um, what we'll do is we'll show a picture and if you know what it is right away, you can uh, raise your hand or chime in and say what it is. Um, if the person who took the photo would like to frame it in some way um, to give some backstory, uh, they can do that. Uh, or you can ask them questions. Um, one version of the game is called Animal, Vegetable, or Mineral, when somebody just thinks of a random object and that's a way to get started. Uh, so we can use that kind of uh, that kind of uh, rubric if you'd like to get started. Uh, the reason I came up with this was um, this is actually a photo from my yard, and so I thought we would start like this um, and see how it goes with this. Um, so there you have it. Fire away. Ask some questions. See if you can figure out what that is and why I think it's pretty cool from a master naturalist perspective. Is that a hole in the ground? Yes, that's a hole in the ground. Is it a snake hole? It could be a snake hole, but that's not what it is. Oh. Is it made by a spider? Um, judging from the size of it, looking around it, it's probably bigger than what a spider would dig. Oh. I've seen them that large in Arizona. Oh, have you? Wow. Okay. Is it on the water's edge? Yep, there's water there. And that's where the hole is. Is it a mammal? Yes, it's a mammal. Star-nosed mole? What was that? Star-nosed mole, perhaps? Uh, nope. Is it a what, mushroom? What makes, you, what makes you think it would be a star-nosed mole? Well, they like burrows and they like near being near the water. Ah, okay. Yep. As far as I know, I'm not sure. We didn't actually see the critter, but we have evidence of what it is or lack of evidence or for what it is. So um, I don't think it's the mole. Is it a muskrat? Muskrat. It's a little too small a hole for a muskrat. It's mm -hmm. probably about the size of a uh, little smaller than a tens tennis ball. Is it a frog? Mm, nope, it's a mammal. Oh, you said mammal, right? Weasel? Ah, there we go. It's actually, from what we know, it was a mink, uh, mm -hmm. not a weasel. Um, in our pond, we had stocked our pond with uh, sunnies and perch and bass and a couple of nice big koi, and they were all wiped out one winter. And there were no skeletons, no dead bodies floating on the surface. And we had no clue about what happened to all the fish over the winter. And poking around on the web and asking people what I found out is mink will dig a hole. They, to get into the pond when it's frozen over, they don't dig through the snow or the ice. They dig through the snow into the mud and then swim, burrow, and then swim directly into the water and then they carry the fish out the hole and eat it at their nests. So if you ever dig a pond and all the fish disappear, that could be, that could be why. So. Who, who got that one? Who said weasel? Someone came pretty close. I did. Great, great. Okay, so the next one was sent by David Shepard and he sent these two plants and he sent an explanation for why they're in the same picture. So, David, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Well, not at the moment. They don't have, they're not uh, chlorophyll plants. They're both of them. That's Indian pipe. And I think they changed the name of it. Yeah. And 
that, that is correct. That one that you're circling there is an Indian pipe or a ghost pipe. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Does anybody know what this one is? That is. It's like a pair of human legs. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll plead no contest to that. Um, <laughs> and yes, they're mine. But uh, what about the plant? No idea. Is it beech nut? Close. Yeah. I've heard the common name is beech drop. The, uh, the, the true name is, I think, Ep Epiphagus virginiana. Obligate parasite of the beech tree. How far away from a, a beech tree is that growing? Um, we're at, probably as far away as the roots go. What, the, what this critter does, it used to be able to photosynthesize. It found it e easier just to steal the sugar. So it, it taps into the, let me get this right now, it taps into the root of the beech tree. So wherever the roots are, that's where the, that's where the beech drop will grow. Any other questions for Dave or anything else you'd like to add about it, Dave? Are, are they compatible? With each other, does the does yeah, the, it's it, it's kind of funny that the the it doesn't seem to hurt the beech trees at all. In fact, uh, one isn't sure that the beech tree even, even misses the, the sugar that that the beech drop takes. Um, Dave, could you spell? It? You're calling it beech drop, D R O P. Correct. Okay. Yeah, beech drop is in cough drop. Yeah. And it's and it's a is it a parasite then or no? Yes, it is. Okay. Are there related parasites in the same genus that feed off of other trees? Do you know? Um, for beech drop, no. Beech drop is, is a one-off, and it is, is obligate to the beech tree. Now, as far as you know, why it why it's obligate, I'm not very sure. But uh, it would just, I, th I think we all know that the that plants and animals do specialize, and apparently this one did. Um, the ghost pipe, it's associated with the beech tree a lot, um, but this particular photograph was taken in a, in a black cherry grove. Let's see, Christy uh, Mickham has a question. I just wondered if the beech drop was a parasite of the beech tree. I didn't think that it was. Um, well, according to the, what, what first caught my attention with this was that there were no leaves, no, no apparent leaves. And it, but there were what appeared to be flowers. And so I did a little research and what it told me was that this plant was one that originally it had had the ability to photosynthesize and that what leaves you might be able to find on it are now vestigial. In fact, they're, they're almost scalar, uh, but that the, the plant itself has found out it could tap into the root of the beech tree and get its sugar that way. So that that's what it's evolved to do. Okay. So it's an evolutionary thing then. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dave, is it ghost pipe? Is that going to host plant too? It could be beach. Could be yes. Uh, the, the 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 ghost pipe's a little bit different. What it does, it uses the mycorrhizal network. It uses uh, particular varieties of fungus, and I don't have those what those varieties are. Um, the beech trees use them a lot, and in the literature search I did, these are associated widely with the beech. You, you 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 that's a good shot. You'll find them there. Um, but they, what they do is they tap into that mycorrhizal network so that they use the fungus basically to, to launder the sugar. And it's a plant, not a mushroom. 
Correct. If you look carefully there, you see you see, the, the the true name of this guy is is um, you know, having said that, I've, I've just I've just forgotten it. But the but the, the genus name is, is is Monotropa, which means one turn. And you see the as the plant comes up, you see that it turns down at the top. That top is a blossom. And fungi don't the fungi don't have blossoms. So what uh, what this will do over time, the the that that flower that's looking drooping toward the ground right now will will turn upright and open and you allow pollinators come in. That's that's another clue that you can see on these things. Sometimes you'll see you see bees on them. And after it has been pollinated, its seeds are wind cast, and after after that it 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 dies back. Uh, leaves again have, have leaves again have withered away. They're, they are scalar, and because it doesn't need to use the chlorophyll, it's lost those chloroplasts. You can What's usually that? see the remnants all winter. Those blooms are purple and white striped. Yep, there's a there's I think there's a variety of, of this plant, uh, the, the the Monotropa uniflora. Is, is what this thing is. Uh, I think there's a variety of it that can show up with, with some red tints to it. Um, now, someone asked a question about the beech drop. Did it have any relatives? The beech drop doesn't have anything else in the genus. Uh, the, the ghost pipe does. There are a couple other um, monotropas around. Great. One is pretty much located out west. The other one's called a pine sap. It's, it, it's, a, it's a reddish plant, but very definitely the same same ilk as, as this one. Well, thanks, Dave. And next we have an artsy photo from Trix. Trix, would you like to say anything about it? Uh, not really. <laughs> uh, you guys can ask. Yep, that's right. Ellen got it. It's a skunk cabbage. It's an Eastern skunk cabbage. She got it. Ellen, how were you able to figure that out so quickly? Let's see, she's typing in. Oh, her audio is not working. She says she has them in her yard. That's great. That's great. It is one of the first. Um, it comes up in early spring. Maybe you're familiar with it. And it's called skunk cabbage um, because it stinks. And um, like that. And the leaves are come up and um, they also, they if you crimp the leaves or anything, they'll, they smell quite pungent too. I, it's really a pretty flower and it has a bulb and when it opens up, there'll be kind of like a, a round bulb in there. And Laurie Dittmer added in the chat, looks a lot like a pitcher plant mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. That there's obviously the, obviously the shape is different, but the colors do. Color. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Trix. And now we have one from Victoria Barnsby. Is Victoria here tonight? I don't think she is. Um, so this she submitted three, and this is one that I had chosen from it. And there's something very wrong with that picture. Obviously it's not a native plant. What's not a native plant? Whatever that is. <laughs> it seems like- Well, actually, <laughs> well, yeah, this is a bayberry. That's a native, mm -hmm. but you're on the right track. <laughs> you're on the right track. Keep going with that idea. Oh, well, you said it's native though, right? Mm-hmm. Is it the wrong mm -hmm. kind of baby? There's, there's a vine on it. Ah, there's a vine on it. Mm -hmm. 
Looks like a honeysuckle. Um, according to Victoria, she said it's a mile a minute vine, which is one of the listed invasive ones. I haven't actually seen mile a minute, so I don't know. Is there anybody who's seen it? Yeah, I've seen it, pulled it. That doesn't look like mile a minute. Oh, wait oh. a minute. Bottom right hand corner does. Down here. This triangular shape. Right. And it should have backward barbs. Mm -hmm. And I don't yeah. see any of the flower cups. But. So this is the the bayberry stem that's been dragged downward. And I think the extension here is the vine that she's referring to. The leaves yeah. have been turned upside down there. Mm -hmm. So. Yep. Oh, Eileen yeah, says know. she's seen it with smaller leaves. Yeah, that's a good size leaf. Yeah, yeah the, in the email that she sent me, Victoria said that uh, she took a photo of the plant and knew that it, the vine didn't belong there, but didn't know what it was. And she sent it off somewhere and somewhere, someone ID'd it for her. So a little bit of irony there. Uh, let's see. So here's the next one. Deb, are you here tonight? Oh, crabs. So, uh, let's see. Deb's not here. This is uh, what she sent me in her email. So this is her speaking. She said she ran across this. And whoever said that they look like crabs, that's what she thought. They do. They look like crabs. Mm -hmm. But they're not. It's like some kind of discarded nymph shell. Uh, let's see. Discarded nymph shell is a little closer. Somebody, Lynn in the uh, chat, uh, says they look like barnacles. But actually, they found it in a woodland, so they're not barnacles. And somebody raised their hand. Somebody had their hand raised. Christy McCann. Are they spiders? Uh, could be, but they're not. A dragonfly nymph? Mm, somewhat close. They look like they've been discarded, like something's left them and gone on to something else. Yep, that's what the answer that she got could be that. In the email that she sent, she said, the people who figured it out, these two segments gave it away. Or those two bits of it gave it away. I can't zoom in. How many legs does it have? Uh, these only have four. These have a bunch more. Are those two segments that you pointed out, are they from the same creature? Uh, they think so, yes. Same individual? They think so, yes. Centipede or millipede, perhaps? Bingo. So this is the answer she got. She sent it to oh. a biologist at Wells and said it probably was a type of millipede that had either shed its exoskeleton or had been eaten and something discarded yeah, the probably. bits. Wow. And I guess it was this last segment that wasn't hollow which kind of gave it away according to that. She doesn't give a sense of the size but looking at the fragments it looks like it's pretty big. Has anybody ever seen this? I've seen one or two in the woods, and, and, and they, they can get good sized. Like two inches? Yeah, I think I've seen one closer to four, actually. Wow. Okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah, the ones I've seen are about the size of your thumb and, and circumference. 
Really? Okay. Mm -hmm. So they do have some meat inside that something would eat. Yeah. Okay, so Colleen sent this next one. Um, uh, not Colleen, Colette. Um, oh. Other than the photos, is there anything you want to add to that? It looks like somebody was attacked. Let's see, I, Colette's here tonight, right? Yep. Yes, yeah, I just yep. unmuted. Yep. So, um, these photos were taken in our backyard um, in February. And Rand Randy said it looks like somebody was attacked. Yes, that's very good observation. What what was attacking what? It looks like a bird to me. Yes. Let's say a hawk. Yes. A red tail hawk. Can you kind of guess what it was? Uh, what the, what it was after? Most likely a squirrel or a vole. Yes, ma'am, a squirrel. A squirrel. So it was a very interesting experience to watch. We had this hawk. So in this, the first picture on the left, uh, the hawk um, swooping in to grab the squirrel, and then. The middle picture was a juvenile that wanted the squirrel from this um, larger red tail hawk that had um, captured it. And then the third picture is all the fluff and eating um, that went on by the hawk that would not share it. So we were very lucky to just watch this whole thing happen. So. Hmm. So you got to watch him spread his wing over the prey. Yes, and turn his back. Yes, and turn his back toward the juvenile that you know wanted a free um, snack. So that's what made the tracks in the snow was his wing protecting wing. the prey. Yes, it was really beautiful. It was like artwork in the snow. You couldn't recreate that in any way. It's quite lovely. I did leave out the picture of the carcass. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought that, you know, there was enough there to go on. So. Other things you'd like to add, Colette, or other questions for Colette? <laughs> Lori in the chat box wrote, turkey making snow angels. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Thanks, Colette. Uh, while we're on uh, the theme of death and dying, this next one is two photos, one submitted by Joy Popel and the other submitted by Marla. And it's not really something to guess per se, but there are similarities and some questions. So, so oh, this yeah. is what Joy wrote about that one, and this is what Marla wrote about that one. So I'll give you a second to look through that. So Joy or Marla, do you have anything to add beyond what I quoted? Kind of gave it away. <laughs> I, I find these occasionally on our property and sometimes when I'm hiking and they're always dead, left there, maybe have been killed by a fox or something. But uh, I do know that they have a toxic saliva. And I wonder if they're distasteful to predators. And I said I would research it more. Um, alas, I have not. <laughs> Happy to listen to anybody else. Joy, if you know anything else. 
Well, I thought this morning we should have maybe touched the scat and the rodent to see if they were still warm. We didn't. We didn't see any flies buzzing around. So we didn't really do a thorough investigation on site. The one thought I had about Joy's picture was maybe there was something in the scat, like the seeds, that was poisonous to the shrew. Mm. Oh. Um, but that wouldn't it I explain. Because he has a little dirt on his chin right here. Like, you know, he's been munching on something. And hmm. it didn't work, whatever it was. It was not good. That would lend to him maybe eating the scat and it being poisonous to him. Yeah. Hmm. Do we know what kind of, whose scat this is? What animal? Could be bear. Is that <laughs> large? Got a lot of seed. Maybe fox or raccoon. It's it's actually pretty small. The it's, the, yeah. the shrew yeah. is not that big. It's like no. that yeah. the most. So it could be something that that animal ate. I admit I've never found a shrew and a with the scat together like that. I just find dead <laughs> shrews. Its head was pretty well tucked into the scat. Mm -hmm. hmm. <laughs> Maybe they're just very camera shy. Christy Mickham has her hand up. Well, Christy Mickham was with me. Yeah, I was with Joy. And um, since then, I've been doing a lot of research <laughs> about this picture. And from the contents of the scat, it appears to be fox. Because um, it does have bad berries but it also has the um in it appears to be some animal type um particles in it but i was reading about whether the fox actually defecates around its prey and it will do that just in the process of you know marking its territory and that this is its cash, but it won't eat the shrew because of um, what Marla has said that they do have toxic saliva. And if they were to eat the shrew at all, it would only be to eat the body and not the head. Mm. So, Marla, I did look up um, shrews are not palatable due to powerful scent glands. Yeah, that's so that the owls will tend to eat them. That's, uh. That was the other thing that they had a musky smell to them. Okay, yeah. that might explain it. But they do have a venomous saliva too, so I don't know if they they have bitten something and, and uh, it just ended up leaving the scene. Also, by the <laughs> way, shrews are not rodents. Oh, I'm gonna put in the order that they belong to. They're in oh. a different different classification. Eileen in the oh. chat box wrote, I've seen dead shrews after they've been flooded out of their dens. Mm -hmm. Was it wet when you both no, found them? Quite dry for mine. Nope. Hmm. Hmm. Marla, how do you pronounce that um, family classification? Uh, it's uh, an order. Yeah. Um, uh, Ulipo, uh, Tyfla. It doesn't roll off my tongue. Yeah. I, <laughs> I don't do little... mammals in general, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, now we all have homework to figure out the mystery of what, what went on here. Great. <laughs> Well, thanks, Joy. Thanks, Marla. Uh, let's see. The next one, again, is two photos of the same or very similar things sent in, one by Bill and one by Victoria. Let's see. There. Whoa. Mm. Mm. I just Bill, put the picture of the bug on the right, and I haven't identified it yet. 
The one on the right, is that a ladybug larva? Bill, Victoria, would you like to respond? See, I saw Bill was here earlier. I'm here, but I put it on uh, iNaturalist and it came back. I think it's not I'm sure, not but sure. maybe a Japanese beetle. Or I forgot what they said on it. But I saw the two of them on the leaf, and that was odd to me. I couldn't figure out what was going on there. Well, this one has uh, started to pupate. Yes. Are they butterflies? That looks like it could be starting to curl into the pupa. Are they butterflies? No. Or skippers? Maybe they're skippers. I think they're all beetle larvae. Yeah, I, I was pretty sure that they're all, because this is the pupa for a ladybug beetle. This was in a, uh, a large pile of mud in a levee and a one blade of grass and they were both on it. Stood, stood right out of it. Christy, oops. Christy Mickham has her hand up. <laughs> Just wondering if the blue one is a um, the larva of a click beetle. A what beetle? Click. Spell it for me because it says like an echo. D L I C K. Um, Lynn says this is a ladybug larva. Okay. Yeah. And I think this is uh, just a side view of a slightly um, more mature ladybug. When I looked at some photos online, the stripe got a little bit farther down. As it Bill, anything to add? I, I looked up on the iNaturalist thing and they called it an Asian lady beetle. Mm -hmm. So it is a lady beetle. Thank well, thanks, Bill. Thanks, Victoria. So we're into our bug segment now. Uh, the next one. This was submitted by Nina, and I think she said she couldn't be here this evening. Nina, are you here? So this is what, oops. So this is what she wrote. I submitted this picture into iNaturalist, and then somebody suggested that it was Owlet Moth, but then, so the, she sent this photo with the question of, uh, can somebody give her more information than that? So I looked up Owlet Moth, and this is what it says in Wikipedia. There are 11,700 species of Owlet Moths. So that's not a particularly helpful answer. So I thought these would be next steps of where to go to look. Nina thought that it might have been a new hatchling and that this was the egg that it had just come out of. Anybody have any thoughts about that? After looking at all the spongy moths in my neighborhood right now, that's what it reminds me of. But. The egg reminds you or the caterpillar? The caterpillar looks like the um, the remnants of the spongy moth. They're the ones that have gotten the virus. Yeah. Well, no, those are usually U-shaped or V-shaped. But when they shed that skin. Ah, so this would be the exoskeleton, the skin of an instar? 
That's what it reminds me of. I've never seen an owlet moth, though. Well, when I checked out some of these, is anybody is anybody familiar with any of them? Does anyone have a favorite one that they like? I like Bug Guide. Bug Guide. So we can. I haven't checked that caterpillar one though. I'll check that out. Mm -hmm. So when I looked up a few different outlet moths, none of the outlet moths have the hairs or the spikes. Um, so my first thought, uh, I don't know who would mention it, was that it was either a tussock moth or um, a spongy moth, also known as a gypsy moth. Now this wouldn't be the egg of a gypsy moth. Um, so I wonder if this might actually be a gall, just happened to be next to the caterpillar, or if, as somebody said, the exoskeleton, um, and they just happened to be together, and Nina thought that they were connected, but they, they weren't. Is anybody familiar with leaf galls? Does that look like an egg? Because it's definitely not the egg of a tussock moth, or a gypsy moth, or a spongy moth. Um, is anybody familiar? Does that look like a leaf gall? Would the moth be eating the gall or trying to get into it? Anybody have insight into that? So that's homework number two. Copy down these websites and for next class, come in, figure out what that picture is. Does anybody want me to click on one of these so you can see what it looks like? Yes, please. The caterpillar uh, one. A particular one? The first the caterpillar one. one. Sure. Okay, I'll probably have to... Did, are you seeing it now or do I have to reshare? No, I'm not seeing it, but that's all right. I don't want you to have no, to. No, I can, I can reshare. Now are you seeing it? Yes. Yep. yep. So you can go in by state, look at all the caterpillars in your state. You can uh, split between moth and butterfly. Are you seeing this tool now where... You would put the colors, oh, input black. your state. So that was black and black. We'll go down to New York. And then you can refine the results. So if you put hairy fuzzy, it narrows down the choices. Oh, fabulous. So whoever had suggested that it was an exoskeleton, that actually seems like that might be on track there. Because there were no pure black, hairy or spiky ones on this website. So that could very well be the case. Can you scroll up on that for oh, Sure. Yeah, I'll go ask, Has anybody ever seen one of those monkey slug caterpillars? It's a third one down, I think, in the middle. This yeah. one? Yeah. That is the ugliest thing. <laughs> no, I've never seen that. <laughs> it almost reminds me of a starfish. Great. Thank you. Okay. I can blame you for not getting my work done because I'm going to be looking at that website, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, somebody had put something in chat. Uh, okay, so the next one is by Marla, and I put this here because it's a follow-up. We just looked at bug guides, and here's a little hint. Why can't you find this on any of those bug guides? Marla, would you like to give any other hints sure. or background? So you might at first think this might be a fuzzy bee, 
but look a little closer. And I did a, a view under the scope. So you can see little particles stuck to its abdomen. That, that's a hint. And there's also one, I placed one, one that I found this morning as my uh, screen background. So you can get a better look. And that's what it looks like when it's stuck to a window. The eyes Are look more fly-like. Are those eggs? Yeah, is it a long leg fly? No. Well, um, here's another hint. This particular organism that we're more interested in is not the fly, but it's what's infecting the fly. Oh. So something's being paras parasitized here. Is that a, a wasp larvae? Not a wasp larvae, but you the first thing you said was right. Something being something being parasitized. Yeah. Are those mites? No. But that's a good guess. If they were mites, you might be able to see them. My mites can be pretty small. Uh, but yeah. they would look a little more like mites. So I, I tried to photograph different phases of it. The one in the upper left is the phase, I guess in this series is, is the first phase and the others are after that beautiful bloom happens. I was afraid I was giving too many hints, <laughs> maybe not enough. Ask me a question. Is that fly being parasitized by a fungus of some kind? Yes, bingo. Okay. And, and what we're seeing are the fruiting bodies. Um, what you're seeing are the spores. Yeah, yeah. So okay, actually, okay. yeah, okay. coming okay. out. Yeah, yeah, so this, yeah, yeah. It's, you can't really see the fruiting bodies so much. Uh, I, I probably should have also done a scope picture. Well, it's in its full phase, but uh, I was uh, so interested, I just want to leave it there. And this uh, process has been repeating itself on our front porch for the past three weeks. So um, the fungus is called Entomophthora uh, genus, and it's a complex. There's several of them, and I'm not sure exactly which one it is, but it might be Entomophthora muscae, which is refers to the fly. And the, um, the first word, Entomophthora, I'll, I'll put it in the chat refer it, it means insect killer or yeah it means insect killer but it's it has um an interesting way of not killing the fly immediately but rather uh, it causes the fly to be a zombie so if you've ever heard of these fun fung these fungi who that um infect an insect and then the insect behaves in a way it normally would not so in this case the fly crawls up something and get gets stuck in a position. Its proboscis is stuck down to the surface and it tilts its abdomen up and it just sits there in a state of uh, being paralyzed and after it's been infected with this fungus by a spore of the fungus. And then there are little structures called hyphae that basically eat away at its insides, eventually killing it. It takes a little while. And then um, what you see in the upper left is that the hyphae has, have broken through the segments of the abdomen, the sections, and there, their fruiting bodies are emitting spores. And what you end up with is this little shower of spores. If you go back uh, into the New York Times, I can supply that link if you're interested. There's a fascinating article about this fungus. And how uh, some uh, mycologists studied the mechanism and the little spore bearing structures actually shoot each spore out like a little cannon. So the spores make this spray. So if you look behind my head, you see the spray. So all along 
the 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 on the front porch the windows there are getting these little flies stuck to them with this little spray of spores around them and the reason this the the fly has positioned its abdomen out is to shoot the spores <laughs> as far as they can go and they infect other flies and one of the common ways apparently that uh this fly uh spore the the fungal spores can infect other flies is that a male comes along and tries to mate with a corpse of a dead female and um, it will get infected. So I liked it so much that I made it my screen background. <laughs> Please share that article. I'll, I'll, let me share that article. Thank you. Hang on. It's, fast, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, the weird thing about this is that normally Outbreaks happen in the, the wet months of spring and fall, but it's been, I mean, in uh, near Ithaca, New York, and it's been very dry. Um, so I don't know what's up. Uh, I'm in touch with somebody at Cornell. Oh, that's the other thing that's interesting is uh, at Cornell, there's somebody studying, uh, not exactly this one, but a related fun fungus uh, with the purpose of using it as a insecticide for flies. Um, but from what I've read so far, scientists working on this particular fungus have not been able to propagate enough of it or, or have it be long lasting enough for applications to kill flies. But who knows? Hmm. That's all I know. Marla, put the link to the New York Times article in the chat for people to see. Sure. And I'll, I'll put another interesting one. There's a good one by, um, uh, University of Wisconsin's, uh, I think it's their extension office. There you go. Let's see. Christy raised her hand. Christy? Christy, did you have a question? Christy Mickham? Yeah, I forgot. I'm, I'm still muted. Ah. <laughs> Um, does it attack any type of fly or only one specific type? I was not too sure about that. These are um, some species of small house fly. But it's a, it's a, I, I believe that, that it's a complex with, as with a lot of species, especially in the fungal world, there are, um, there can be different variations of species that are right. specific, host specific. Okay, thank you. There's a lot I don't know about, th about this. I'm, I'm just fascinated by it because I keep seeing it. Well, thanks, Marla. And let's see, next one is from Mary McNeil. And she put this comment in her email saying, it looks cool, but it's not. Mary, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, um, it's uh, it's in the water. In case you can't tell, it's floating. It looks like an algae bloom of some type. Yeah, it's a hazardous algal bloom. So it has it's a cyanobacteria, along with the spirogyra. So is the spirogyra the green stringy? Yes. And the cyanobacteria is the cloudy bit around it? And it actually had a bit of like effervescence to it. It was kind of bubbly. Needless to say, you wouldn't want to swim in that water. Where did you find this? Uh, it was in the Erie Canal. Did you know what it was or did you uh, look it I up? I knew or? that it wasn't good. So the DEC was contacted and they're actually the ones that tested it and uh, told me what it was. Did you submit a sample to them or did they have They actually to come came and, and took the sample themselves. I see. Was this isolated or did you find... Um, there was some, but they didn't figure it was wide enough spread at the time. And what's weird about it, it was really quite early in the season. 
because usually not until the water temperature gets a little warmer. And so this was probably about a month to six weeks ago when the water wasn't that warm yet. So they're just keeping a watchful eye now, but it wasn't a large amount taking over a big area. So they, they're just monitoring. There hasn't been any posting to close it off. Unfortunately, it is in an area of the Erie Canal where um, people do a lot of kayaking and fishing and recreation. So it makes me a little concerned because it's not something you want to have contact with. Are fresh water algae blooms fairly common in this part of the country or is this rare? No, it's, it's common. The algal blooms are common. And unfortunately, the hazardous ones with the cyanobacteria are becoming more common because of the nutrient loading that's in the um, creeks and streams from runoff from fertilizers, from runoff from farming, from runoff from the large geese populations that, you know, leave a lot behind along the shorelines. And the increasing so water temperature water. also right. plays into it. So the conditions are getting more so that it's becoming more prevalent. And Lynn in the chat box also said, we have had hazardous algae blooms in our lake in early May because of the spring rains and all the runoff that Mary had mentioned. And then Marla asks, do you know if this can be spread by boats? It can be spread um, as a lot of uh, invasive species can be spread on surfaces. So that's why they're pretty um, up a lot of effort into putting up postings about telling people to clean their kayaks and their boats or inspect them anyways to make sure they're not transporting anything. But the conditions would still have to be right. But regardless, a lot of things can be transported. Uh, invasive species is probably the biggest concern with the transporting on boats and, and recreational things. Yeah, we have a big campaign going with uh, clean, play, and go for invasives on boats. Mary, did they say anything about the spirogyra? Did that just happen to be where the bacterium, the cyanobacterium, got lodged? I thought it was the... unusual that the, the combo of the two elements together, but I didn't get any more information on that, which is really what there were some other uh, globs of it. This one was like had the most artistic look yeah. to it, but there were other ones that were in that same multicolor mm -hmm. and it's very bright. So you could see it from the distance. It really actually caught my eye from a ways away that it was unusual. So I, I don't really know why the two of them were joined together, but a lot of times they are combos. Why those two, I'm not sure. Other questions for Mary? Well, thanks, Mary. The Thank next you. one was sent by Steve Kinney. He couldn't be here tonight. He's at Disney World, he said. So this is the first photos. Any comments, questions? Bugs or vines? Bugs or vines? Mm, nope. some sort of borer channels, bark beetle damage from Lynn and from Marla. Well, it's interesting because in this next slide, you'll see what Steve wrote. Uh, let's see, Christy Sullivan asked, is it an oak tree? And Lori Dipper asked, lichens. So this is what Steve wrote. Take a minute to read that. So his thought was that the 
channels were made by a bark beetle, but that something had then infested that, a black fungus. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. he sent it off to two people and this is what they said. Has anybody seen that? Anybody stumbled on that in the woods? I've never seen anything like it. Give some good ideas for Halloween decorations, though. Yeah, really. <laughs> uh, Christy says, Christy Sullivan says she's seen it on dead oak trees. Did Steve tell us what what sort of tree it was, or did he know? <laughs> no, he, he didn't say. Let me go back to uh, largely debarked tree. Um, can anybody tell from the no, bark down here what it might have been? Carrot, maybe? Got that potato chip-like bark. Mm. What was that somebody said? I didn't hear that. It said it has a bark like a cherry tree, that um, layered. Ah, and Camille yeah, like wrote, black. and Camille wrote, yes, Marlo, that's what I thought. So we have two votes for a cherry tree. No, 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 my comment, I'm sorry, was not about cherry tree. It oh. was about a, a fiction series on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone watch Stranger Things? It looks like the monster goo. From that. That's great. <laughs> ah, that's great. Maybe they were inspired by it. Mm -hmm. Well, just like the uh, creators of uh, the scene, the famous scene from the first Alien movie may have been, you know, similar to the fly fungus that we just you know, looked at. Let's see, Christy Mickham raised her hand again. Looks like a conifer. I um, I just would concur that it looks like black cherry to me because I always learned burnt cornflakes, but. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we have one more for this evening. Um, thank you all for being here and for playing along. Uh, we've seen some kind of uh, you know, depressing, disturbing things, so I thought we'd end on a happy note. Thank this you. isn't something to guess, but this was um, uh, a nice story that Camille had uh, submitted. And so I'll just show you a, 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 an image and then Camille can comment on it. Mm -hmm. So I saw for the first time this year a black burning warbler and I grew up with this painting in my house that my dad had painted. He was forced to paint it in high school art class and he for some reason picked, everyone had to pick a bird to paint and he just randomly picked a black burning warbler. So I grew up with this picture of <laughs> this warbler in my house for years and didn't really get into birding until a few years ago. And finally this spring, I just happened to see one and I was really excited. And I told my dad and I asked him, do you still have the painting? And he was like, no, I threw it out. Oh, no. Uh -huh. um, it was really good too. Like it looked, this is a photo from Audubon, but it looked exactly like this photo. Like he is, even though he doesn't like art, he is very artistically talented. And so I'm very sad that he threw out this beautiful painting. And I love that. Paul put together like <laughs> the picture that I submitted and kind of I don't know photoshopped or however you did this into kind of a funny artsy photo but yeah I think black burning warblers are beautiful and even though they're not a species that's of great concern or you know one that people are 
writing about like we need to save the polar bears um, it's not that type of situation but I think it's something that I felt like I had a connection to just from my childhood and I was very excited to see it this year for the first time in spring. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Paul. This Thank you, great. Paul. Yes.